and council member, we are streaming. Thank you. Thank you to those watching on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and every other platform out there. Uh, you can uh, follow along. You can respond to us on Facebook, Twitter with questions. Uh, we'll do our best to pass them along. When you RSVP'd, many of you submitted questions. I'll be asking a number of those. We'll also be calling on people. Uh, if you wish to uh, participate uh, and ask a question yourself, please consider joining us on the uh, Zoom and you can RSVP at uh, Ben Kalo slash events. So we're about a minute in and figured now is as good a time as any to start. So thank you. Welcome to Parenting During the Pandemic, uh, a town hall that we've put together. I'm council member Ben Kalos, that's at Ben Kalos on social media, and you probably already know that if you're watching on social media. I have the distinct honor of representing the Upper East Side, East Harlem, East Midtown, and Roosevelt Island. Uh, I grew up on the Upper East Side. I am a proud graduate of uh, the public school system. I had the distinct honor and privilege of getting one of the most, the, one of the best parts and a shining point in my education uh, at the Bronx High School of Science. That is the part of the education that I am most proud of. Uh, and I'm just so, I wanna make sure that everyone has the same opportunities that I did. I wanna thank everyone for joining us this, move, this evening. And I wanna take a moment to thank all the organizations and agencies for presenting tonight and for the work you do every day to help children and families across the city. We have the 92nd Street Y Parenting Center uh, if you're a first time parent like me, they are the resource on the Upper East Side, whether you wanna get uh, lessons on infant CPR or just how to be a better parent or how to prepare. Uh, they are great for giving you the skills you need to parent and also just calming first parent nerves or even uh, if it's not even your first child. We have our brothers and sisters from the United Federation of Teachers, uh, the Council of School Supervisors and Administrators, the New York City Department of Education and Cope with Schools here with us this evening. New York City, along with the rest of the country, is going through uh, a pandemic that many of us have never experienced unless you happen to be a uh, person over the age of uh, 100. And uh, we've all been asked to adapt. And the reason I wanted to put this together is because um, as a parent in a uh, one bedroom with my wife and my two-year-old daughter, I've been personally struggling. Um, I think my daughter's been struggling. Uh, a lot of furniture ends up getting turned upside down. And I realized that a lot of parents were probably in the very same situation as I was. As I spoke to some of my friends who were parents of everyone from kids my age to kids in high school, a lot of parents were sharing the, the same struggles. And when I started talking to my team about it, uh, my wife, who is pretty cynical, uh, she, she's gotten to spend three months with a front row seat on me doing my job, standing in the living room all day, every day, at 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Every day, she said, you know what? This is an event I actually want to go to. So I don't mind uh, listening. So she's listening from the couch. And I'm incredibly lucky to have her support and my daughters. I can't imagine doing this without them. Um, and before we begin, uh, some of our presenters have shared some resources and my team will share it in the chat. Uh, from the United Federation of Teachers, they wanted to share something called Epic Books. It's a free for parents for 30 days and you can get it at uh, getepic.com. Every weekday morning at 11 a.m. and noon, PBS Channel 13 airs a one error our educational program for children in 3K through second grade called Let's Learn NYC. New York City educators teach the lessons. It's free on regular TV. No Wi-Fi device or cable required. New episodes will air through the end of the school year, Friday, June 26th, and past episodes are archived at pbs.org slash so slash Let's Learn NYC. I know that that's what my daughter will be watching tomorrow morning. Uh, and uh, we also have a resource from the New York City New York Center for Children and its series of videos about coping at home as a family during COVID-19, including creating a schedule, exercise, healthy eating, having fun, and coping with stress. Uh, and we're gonna hear so much more. And just one other resource, uh, I know that this is on Zoom. Uh, we also do have folks who have dialed in. And uh, one of the resources that we wanted to make sure people were aware of is that uh, 
when Spectrum wanted to buy Time Warner, one of the things that I joined our now Attorney General Tish James to ask for is affordable internet. And so any student in the city of New York can get access to something called Spectrum Internet Assist or in depart different parts of the city, it might be Altice Internet Assist, but the program is called Internet Assist. It is broadband, 30 megabits or faster, uh, and it's $14.99 a month. Spectrum, uh, I, I reached out to them at the start of this pandemic along with Silicon Harlem, and they've agreed to make it free for 60 days for any family that doesn't already have broadband. So if you know of anyone who does not have broadband in the home, particularly our teachers and administrators, uh, and the kids need it, and if the uh, 4G card just isn't uh, stacking up, then uh, this is a resource. Uh, when they sign up, they need to make sure to say, we want the 60 days for free, and we do qualify, we're free and reduced school lunch eligible, we want the $14.99 thereafter. And uh, I believe, uh, I think something like 700,000 children and their families should qualify. So um, that's it for the announcements, and uh, I'd like to get started. I want to introduce Sally Tannen, the director of the 92nd Street Y Parenting Center, and Tracy Birkin, Director of Learning Services at the 92Y. The 92nd Street Y is a community center on the Upper East Side where people can connect through culture, arts, and entertainment and conversation. You've already heard my own personal story about how great they are. Please join me in welcoming the 92nd Street Y. So thank you very much. And we really appreciate you inviting us. Um, and yes, the Parenting Center is celebrating its 40th year this year. Um, so we've been around for a long time supporting families and um, giving you the support and the encouragement that every parent needs. Um, so I'm just gonna start talking about, my, our focus this tonight is about young children. Um, and I have to start by just acknowledging how hard this has been for everybody. This is really hard for parents. This is really hard for, it's not actually as hard for young children. I think young children are actually benefiting greatly by having their parents be so close to them. As, as hard as it is for, for working parents at home, your children are doing much better than you think they are by having you nearby. So that should make you feel better, even, even when it's frustrating and hard. But it is a huge adjustment. It has been a huge adjustment um, for parents to be working at home and taking care of their children. Um, and when you have a young child under five, you, you, you have to be paying attention. You know, you can't send them off to, to do their homework by themselves or to, to play by themselves. You have to be nearby. Um, and with everything being on screens, it's a dilemma. It's a dilemma for parents who don't want their children in front of screens, either at all or for short periods of time. But what we've learned during these three months is that not all screen time experiences are alike. We know children need routines and predictability, so we've been able to begin the same way with a song or hello to everyone and ending the same way. It, when things are predictable for children, it, um, they can relax. Um, and while it takes a while for children to warm up to this way of interacting on a screen, um, they do get used to it. And we have seen that in this period of time that they adjust. Doesn't mean they have to be sitting in front of the screen. They can be hearing and listening without being right in front of it. Um, there's lots of ways of interacting with the screen. There's a passive way which, where there's no interaction. And then there's an active way where children are interacting with people on the screen and there are activities that lend themselves to moving and ones that don't. Um, and spotlighting them makes a big difference. Allowing kids to use headphones so they can walk around is also helpful. Um, and we have tried very hard as many other early childhood teachers have around the city to come up with activities for children that will engage them and, um, and keep them connected for short periods of time, and then going off and, and playing. Um, Tracy, can I, would you like to add anything so far? Sorry, I couldn't. 
Thank you so much for having us. I wanted to um, piggyback on what Sally said and also something that was happening earlier um, is that it's, I think somebody said today was day 105. And I think if we all said about 105 days ago that they were gonna be home, that parents were gonna be home with their children, they would all say, oh my God, this could never happen. This could never happen. This could never happen. So all you parents out there, I'd like to just applaud you and say, you did do it. And we've all done it. And the teachers that we've been working with, Sally and I, have watched all of the parents really learn and grow and become, we feel like it's become more of a parent-child-teacher relationship. And it's really been very helpful for the teachers, and I'm assuming it's been very helpful for the parents as well. And I wanted to say that since there's so many unknowns out there, that all the teachers are really been trying really hard to figure out what is best for the children. And I think we're onto a good place. I think we really are into a good place because I think that what we've learned is that we can figure this all out together. And what Sally was saying about the different things that we're doing as early childhood teachers, and I look forward to hearing um, as we go on the, and hear how the upper schools are doing everything, that kids are the ones that can really, they're okay about this. It's just the grown ups that are experiencing something new and if we follow their lead which we have been doing at the 92nd street y it's been very helpful and so if you're listening to your kids and if the teachers are listening to the kids and we can all come together to figure this out i think that is where we're at because i i think everyone's always questioning well, what's going to happen next year and since none of us really know i think it's just taking it day by day and again realizing that we've done 105 days and there's been a lot of success stories a lot of success stories and again, that comes from parenting and teachers and families all working together. I wanted to, if I have time, just make a few suggestions on some small ways that children can socialize with friends, because I know that that's a big concern for a lot of parents that their children aren't able to see their friends. And on Zoom, if you choose, if you do things uh, with maybe two or three children at a time, and you maybe you have a regularly scheduled call with a few friends, that your child may be missing. Um, arrange for a story time with a few friends where a grown up can read to your child and to friends that are on the screen. Have a snack with a friend and let the kids talk about what they're eating. Bring a favorite toy or truck or picture to the Zoom. So there's ways of connecting with things that they love with the people that they love. Thank you very much uh, to the 92Y, uh, to Sally and Tracy and the Parenting Center and Learning Services. Uh, very insightful. Uh, and, and I will say that my daughter is only two. And one of the things I'm most grateful is that I don't think she knows what's going on on the then that uh, mom and dad are around to play a lot more. And that uh, during the height of the pandemic, uh, the, the, her grandparents weren't around, but uh, now that there's testing and everyone can be safe and make sure that no one is uh, carrying it and we can spend time around each other, I don't think she's ever been happier uh, to see her Baba. Uh, next, I want to introduce Henry Rubio, Executive Vice President for the Council of Supervisors and Administrators, a collective that works to protect the rights, wages, benefits, and working conditions of our city's principals, assistance principals, supervisors, education administrators. And I'll just add, we work very closely with uh, CSA around ELI, which is an administrator and teacher training institute that uh, does amazing work for our administrators throughout the city. And uh, we work very closely with them on so very much. So if you can join me in welcoming CSA on behalf of all of our principals. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank Council Member Kalos and his team for putting this together. This is truly an honor to be here uh, along with my fellow, fellow panelists to join in this conversation. Um, I want to just approach this by first saying that, you know, I, I come to this conversation from different perspectives. First, as a product of the New York City school system, K-12, and later a graduate of CUNY and a father of four public school students. I have, my wife and I have two boys and two girls, nine, 11, 13, and 19. And as you can imagine, 
I know exactly what everyone's talking about. I'm a, I'm a, I, I was a high school principal. I work for our union full time now. My wife is a high school teacher. And you can imagine what um, it, I know many of you can imagine what it's like here in the mornings when I'm working, my wife's teaching five classes. She's Zooming three times a week, engaging parents. We've got to feed our kids. We've got to help them with their homework. And so I, um, I jumped on the opportunity to just engage in this conversation, both as an educator, uh, a husband and, and a parent in, in the middle of this pandemic and everything that's going on. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to just share with you. So, um, you know, we were asked to speak on, on how schools have transitioned to, transitioned to digital instruction. And I just wanna take a step back and add some context that as many of you know, you know, our first reported case of COVID was, was in March. And only about two or three weeks later, our entire school system closed. And I mean, when you just think about the fact that you close an entire school system of 1.1 million students, over 100,000 teachers, 7,000 administrators, school administrators that we represent, and not including the thousands of people that work for the city at the Department of Education. Um, and we closed, we closed, we closed schools, um, meaning the, the, the instructional part for one day. And we spent the next three days, school leaders spent the next three days huddled up with their teachers and their staff and their counselors and their school psychologists and the special education teams to figure out in three days, how do we transition the, uh, the brick and mortar um, instruction to remote learning? Selecting a platform, um, deciding on curriculum, putting together curriculum packets for families that did not have uh, internet or devices at home in three days. Um, considering that context, I think that our, our, our school administrators and teachers and other DOE staff members have done a phenomenal job. Not perfect, but considering the circumstances, um, everyone has been dedicated to doing what's best to support kids and their families. Um, and I think, uh, you know, our parents know that, that you know, we have about 1,700 schools. Uh, a very small number of those, those schools in transitioning to remote learning uh, were better equipped. For years, they have uh, developed professional development. They, there, there are some schools with one-to-one -one devices already uh, where teachers have been trained for years in how to do online instruction and a lot of the stuff that's happening now. Uh, that's a very small number of the 1,700. Then you've got the vast majority that are somewhere in the middle, right? They might have a couple of, uh, excuse me, a couple of dozen um, laptops or iPad devices that, that are housed in the school. They don't go home. Um, teachers don't use them regularly. And then you have other school communities where you might only have one computer in the room or one laptop cart. Um, and so transitioning schools over three days has been a monumental task but I really have to take my hat off to the collaboration between parents and schools to do the best we can in the best way we can and, and, and as fast as we can. Um, you know, I wanna thank again, uh, Council Member Kalos, he mentioned our ELI program. Uh, ELI program is our Executive Leadership Institute and it's uh, our affiliated uh, group that does professional development for principals, assistant principals and other administrators, early childhood directors. And we transitioned in two weeks, all our professional development for school leaders in two weeks to online. And thanks to the city council, we were able to do that uh, through their funding, not only to better equip school leaders on how to use technology to support teachers and teachers to support kids, uh, but also do coaching and mentoring online. So we've really moved very quickly to support schools um, through the entire system. Um, you know, initially when we transitioned, a lot of the communication from the Department of Education was understandably um, difficult, unclear and untimely. Uh, but I have to say over the last uh, couple of months, it's gotten better. Uh, our principals and assistant principals and education administrators are getting better information on how to deal with day-to-day -day, um, concerns that are happening at the school level and better able to meet the needs of families as, as, as we, as we um, continue in this remote learning. Um, and you know, I, I hope our, many of our parents are, have experienced 
how our administrators and teachers have gone way, you know, have gotten out of their way to really support kids socially and emotionally. Um, you know, we, we put out information on social media. You have school administrators where they'll do the Pledge of Allegiance every day. Um, you know, you have teachers and school administrators putting on superhero costumes and making light of the situation and just bringing some, just bringing a smile, uh, putting together staff videos, um, coordinating as, um, as one of our panelists here said, coordinating meetings with parents and students after school or during school hours to really get together. Um, and just inspiring and motivating and keeping uh, our staff member and our students' spirit up. And we really owe that to the collaboration of our parents and our communities. Um, I think considering the challenges that we're in, um, our folks have done an incredible job and I know there's room for improvement and we're gonna continue to do that. Um, I know that as a father of four here, uh, I'm incredibly grateful to the teachers and school administrators that my kids attend uh, because I know they're doing the absolute best they can. So thank you. Thank you for everything that you do and that all of our brothers and sisters do. I'd like to now take a moment to welcome the United Federation of Teachers. Uh, we have Dennis Skalt, a district representative for District 1, which is in Lower Manhattan, as well as the Borough of Manhattan. We are so very lucky to have our district representative here in District 2, which spans from the tip of Manhattan all the way up to 100th Street. Uh, Jessica Harvey, who has been there with us fighting for our students and I just wanna say that the United Federation of Teachers is, is, and CSA are very lucky in that they aren't just fighting for their members. Quite often, they're usually just fighting for our 1.1 million children. And they fight hard and they make sure that we have one of the best academic systems in the country. So I just wanna thank Dennis and Jessica. And along those same lines, we've been very lucky that they were able to connect us uh, with uh, Esther Savitsky, one of their chapter leaders and a teacher at PS 134 to speak about online learning and how to engage students. And so if you can join me in uh, welcoming them. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Council Member Ben Kalos. Thank you for having us here today. And thank you for all the parents who showed up. I am Dennis Galt. I'm a longtime special education teacher. I'm also District 1 representative, um, and I'm thrilled to be here. You know, buildings may be closed, but teaching and learning has been going on. Uh, class is still in session, and we're very proud that we're able to deliver quality instruction to the 1.2 million children. Um, my daughter, who w went to a uh, District 2 school, um, she just graduated NYU. So we had a lot of teaching and learning going on in this, in this little apartment for the past couple of months, and we loved every minute of it. Um, so um, just thrilled to be here. I wanna introduce my, my friend and colleague, Jessica Harvey, the District 2 rep. Hi everyone, I'm Jessica Harvey, District 2 rep. I wanted to just uh, quickly say thank you, um, City Council Member Ben Kalos for organizing this and setting it all up for us. Uh, we seem to to cross paths and be working collaboratively in the best of times and the worst of times and everywhere in between. So I appreciate our work and um, together. And I also wanted to say thank you to everyone here, every single person who's on this call um, for staying so engaged with your community. Uh, we all are thrown for a loop by this and we are all making the best of a bad situation and we are doing great work together and it is by continuing to communicate together and that that we can help make this be more successful so i appreciate your being on this call and staying engaged and um then I believe it's probably Esther's turn. <laughs> Hi, thank you. And thank you, Ben. Thank you, UFD members and everyone who's here. My name is Eti Savitsky. I came to teaching right after 9-11, the worst of times, thinking I would stay a while to support children of the Lower East Side. But 20 years later, I'm still there and I've taught every grade in this elementary school. My years with the children have been some of my best times. It brings to mind 
that famous line of Charles Dickens, A Tale of Two City, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, like Jessica just said. I realize that line written so long ago applies to today's times too. These are the worst times. The global pandemic affects us all. But in every bad situation, we must find some good. In terms of teaching and learning, the good is that today we are fortunate to have the technology that allows us the capacity to continue teaching and learning. In a matter of days, teachers were able to transform schools as we knew it to remote instruction. With the aid of technology, we are able to continue to engage our children in learning through various methods, including live teaching, recorded instruction, small and whole group sessions, and one-to-one -one targeted instruction. We are able to take our students beyond the confines of walls and build on an enriched curriculum by providing online resources and exploring topics through audible as well as visual forms, all serving to enhance the learning experience and motivate a desire to learn more. Children are learning that technology is for more than playing games. There's so many tools available for learning. Very young children are learning to use tools for self-directed instruction. Remote learning revolutionized education and pushed us all deep into the 21st century. Another good thing about remote instruction is it supports student agency, which is voice and choice. Students can consume instruction in a self-paced way, select various entry points to access lessons, collaborate with classmates, and interact with teachers in real time. Our technology even allows us to continue to socialize. Our live sessions strengthens connections between teachers, students, and their families. We welcome one another into our homes daily. Families become more involved with some members actually participating in lessons. Opening up our homes helps promote social and cultural awareness as well, bringing us closer together. Remote instruction doesn't feel so remote. As an educator on this panel, I'd like to briefly discuss two topics how we design our lessons and social emotional learning for students so that during the summer you can continue to guide your children towards academic success and support social emotional well being. Teachers align lessons with the curriculum and New York State learning standards. Standards are learning goals that outline what students should know and be able to do at the end of each grade. I'm highlighting five standards that are prevalent in the fourth and fifth grades, grades that I've been asked to focus on tonight. The standards are the same for both grades, but the text complexity varies. By the end of year, students need to be able to read and comprehend literature independently and proficiently at the high end of grades four, five, and text complexity. That includes stories, dramas, and poetry. Being a proficient reader, means being able to, and here are the five standards, draw inferences, compare and contrast, determine meaning of words and phrases, summarize and analyze text. As informal educators, parents can promote critical thinking by keeping these standards in mind when discussing books or articles children are reading. For example, you may ask, how do these characters in your book interact? In what ways are they similar or different? What is the author's message in this article? To learn more about standards across content areas, you may refer to the website Engage NY. Moving on to social emotional learning, the Department of Education provides all elementary schools with SEL curriculum to provide children with life skills to navigate their world in and out of the classroom. SEL is a proactive approach to helping students feel safe so they can focus on their learning. This time has been difficult for students. When schools began remote instruction in March, their worlds changed instantly, as did ours. Educators have worked with great effort and success in establishing structure through remote teaching. It is possible to maintain that structure during the summer by maintaining consistent routines including getting the day started early with scheduled times for educational and fun activities. In uncertain times, providing certainty helps children feel secure. To help smooth transition for children who are heading towards middle school, some suggestions you may wish to consider. If you know which middle school your child will be attending, walk or drive by the school together, 
if you know of peers who will be attending that same school, perhaps reach out now and strengthen those bonds. One of our guidelines as educators is to provide clear and explicit instructions. Consider speaking with children about making right choices and being specific about what right and wrong choices are in order to avoid misunderstandings. It's valuable to listen to and encourage children to share what they're feeling and thinking so they know their concerns and voices matter. You may also reinforce what teachers are sharing with children about changes they can expect in middle school, including their daily schedule, which will be compartmentalized with different teachers for each subject. They may need support organizing materials and managing time. All concepts that seem obvious to us through experiences, but are not yet obvious to our kids. Whichever school they'll be attending, and no matter what school will look like next year, it's helpful to remind children that they will continue to be part of a community that will provide a safe and supporting learning environment. Finally, from my own experience as a formal and informal educator, time with children is fleeting. My students graduate and move on. My own kids have graduated before I knew it. I always cherish our time together. Nothing lasts forever, not the worst of times and not the best of times. Wow, if you can uh, join me and uh, if, you're, if you're able to, we go like this when we have to be silent. It's a twinkle to just uh, give a huge compliment to uh, Esther. Uh, you, you blew me away starting with uh, that literary reference and uh, we, we need to clone you and get you into every classroom along with uh, Dennis and Jessica. And uh, my daughter is too, she is never growing up please don't give me nightmares. But yes, I think all of us know that and we, and we want that for our children. Uh, next up, we have uh, Julian Sepulveda. Uh, he is uh, the Bronx and Manhattan Director at the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs at the Department of Education. He is filling in for the Executive Superintendent for Manhattan, Rosales. Uh, and he is here to talk a little bit about what DOE has been doing over the past couple of uh, months. Particularly, we've heard from a lot of grade school and middle school students uh, asking us about what the new grading system is, how that grading system works, and what the impact of the new grading system is on admissions to middle schools and high schools. And so we hope that Julian can uh, help demystify what's going on and explain the grading systems, the admission systems, and then stick around because I think the, we have a lot of questions for DOE just on how all of this is going to work. Uh, if you can join me in uh, welcoming Julian. Hey folks, uh, Julian here. Uh, just wanted to thank council member Kalos for, for putting this together. Uh, unfortunately, we had a bit of confusion on our part um, with Superintendent Rosales, uh, so I'll be filling in on her steed. Uh, I know there's a lot of questions uh, on, on the enrollment issues. Uh, I have, I'm joined by Nadia Chata on our, on our staff who uh, works in our Office of Enrollment, so I'm really happy to have her uh, on the call. Uh, and I know there's a lot of questions. I know there's a lot of questions about you know, when we are going to be reopening. I know there's a lot of questions about what that reopening is gonna look like. Um, and so I, I just wanted to say, I know those questions will come and I wanted to address them uh, in saying that, you know, we are uh, currently still in the process of trying to figure out what that process looks like. Um, we are still waiting on uh, some guidance, um, both state and city. Uh, guidance on on what uh, what the 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 guidance will be uh, in terms of reopening. We are in the process of trying to figure those things out, um, but as of today, we do not have a hard set answer. Um, I, so so we're working on those issues right now. Um, Nadia, I wanted Nadia, are you on the call? Can we unmute Nadia? Yes, I'm here. Cool. So Nadia, if if um, if if you wanted to just kind of talk over. Um, any broad kind of enrollment uh, 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 sort of um, sort of uh, I'm sorry, uh, any broad sort of enrollment of, uh, uh, actions that we've done throughout the pandemic? 
Yeah, sure. Um, thank you, Council Member, for um, having this meeting and um, for having me here. So I, my name is Nadia. I'm in the Office of Student Enrollment at the um, NYC DOE, and um, I can just share a little bit about what we've been doing in relation to admissions and enrollment for next year. Um, so after the grading policy was announced, we quickly shifted gears and focused on um, how to adjust our admissions policies for next year, in particular for screened schools. Um, these sets of schools look at um, students' academic information to decide who gets admitted, and that usually includes things like state exam scores, grades, and attendance three key metrics that we don't have um, for this year and won't have for next admission cycle. So um, we've really spent the last now probably a month or so um, engaging with as many people um, who wanted to speak with us and um, opening up space to hear from the public on their thoughts on how we should approach this problem. Um, so we had six town halls, one in each borough and one citywide town hall and had thousands of participants through um, those meetings we heard directly from parents um, in that venue and we've also been getting a lot of emails and a lot of comments that we've been reviewing individually and responding to individually. Um, and then in addition to that, you know, we've been having conversations with different advocacy groups, um, smaller groups of parents who who kind of um, come together to advocate for different perspectives on the issue. So, you know, we still have a few of those meetings left and, and we want to honor and welcome um, anybody who wants to, any group in particular that invites us to have a conversation with them. So we have a few of those left and so we're still engaging. Um, but what we really want to do next is do a full analysis and um, kind of assessment of everything we've heard to help us inform what comes next in terms of the policy. There have still been no decisions made um, and we can't commit to a particular timeline at this moment, but we are very cognizant of the fact that families are interested and eager to know um, what will be happening next fall. And so we're keeping that in mind, but we also wanna make sure we give the time to engage and do analysis on our end on the best policy. And that's all I have and I'll be around to answer questions on this. Thank you very much to uh, DOE uh, for uh, providing some guidance and some answers. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to introduce Francis Laura of COPE with Schools NYC, a psychotherapy practices that specializes in school related issues for children, teens and young adults. Uh, with, with no pressure, we've left the most important topic for last uh, Francis is a social worker. We have social workers in my office. We have Debbie Lightbody who's joined us. And uh, one of the things that we've been pushing for with support from CSA and UFT is more social workers in our schools. And honestly, it feels like a lot of what all of us have been going through over the past hundred or so days has been a shared trauma. And so I am hoping uh, that we can look to Francis for guidance on how to do this and uh, how to do this better. So please join me in welcoming Francis. Hello, thank you. I'd like to thank council member uh, Benjamin Kalos uh, firstly on behalf of myself and on behalf of COPE with School uh, NYC for inviting me here today uh, to be able to discuss this very important topic of uh, mental health uh, during this time. Um, I think it's very important to uh, keep in mind that we are experiencing things that we have not seen uh, in several hundred years and many things at once. I mean, yes, we're here firstly because of the pandemic, which we had not seen since like 1918. Uh, but we also have had, uh, on top of that, um, sort of the unrest of the 60s. We've had the depressions of the 20s. Uh, so several decades have kind of come together uh, to forge the time period where everyone is ripe for uh, anxiety and depression. So um, we're just living some really tough times right now. Uh, being at home, dealing with uh, our children. I myself am a parent. I have two boys, a uh, four-year-old 
and a uh, eight year old and uh, you can only imagine and my wife is a teacher so social worker teacher household uh, what that must be like um, so in terms of anxiety and looking at that at home uh, what could that look like and uh, it manifests itself in many ways amongst our children uh, and usually uh, it may not seem like it's anxiety at all um, many times you may notice some uh, nail biting, uh, some fidgeting, uh, irritability, also uh, just trouble sleeping or insomnia, uh, and difficulty concentrating, all depending on the age of our children. You might notice that they want to sleep with you at nights more, uh, just to be closer to you, uh, or they may push away. Uh, it all depends on uh, the child's personality. So how can we address this uh, as parents uh, while we're kind of dealing with different uh, circumstances ourselves? Because obviously our children uh, learn to regulate their emotions through the behaviors and what we model as parents. Um, so the first step that's important is regardless of the age is just not avoiding talking about it. Uh, these are important conversations to be had. Uh, this needs to be addressed. And uh, addressing these um, circumstances, of course, differs by the age of a child. I mean, I know that for a lot of us parents, sometimes we want to um, just uh, avoid the conversation entirely uh, because we don't want to scare our children or because we think that we're bringing up these problems for them. Uh, but they're aware at some level. So uh, the first step is to try to address the issue in an age-appropriate way uh, based on their concerns um, and based on their level of understanding. So for example, your younger children, like your two-year-old councilman, uh, they probably, like you're right, they probably aren't aware at all uh, of what's going on, but they're happy to see that you're at home. So you may need to address very little uh, at this point. Uh, you know, uh, but then middle schoolers, you start having a uh, few more questions. Uh, they're more curious. They're conscious of what's going on. Uh, and you kind of engage them. You need to find out what is it that they know? What do they want to know? Uh, what are their concerns? Um, and you don't want to kind of get ahead of them. Basically, you're trying to meet your children wherever they are. Uh, of course, high schoolers, you know, <laughs> they're going to want details. Uh, they may want some history. They may want uh, some resources. Uh, they're probably going to be kind of the toughest to sort of engage because um, they can have questions that we just don't have the answers to. And that's okay. As parents, we don't always have the answers. And uh, the right thing to do is just kind of acknowledge that we don't know everything if we don't, and just go online and research with them uh, and engage them in that whole searching process. Um, the other important thing to keep in mind and do when addressing our children is to stay calm. Uh, just be able to speak matter-of-factly, uh, to use uh, facts, um, just kind of be able to model that and demonstrate that even though things may seem tough at the time, they're still, we're still there for them. We're still there to be able to help them, uh, to comfort them uh, as necessary. Uh, very importantly though, is also validating, validating their feelings. Um, a lot of children may come and helping them label those feelings and then uh, helping them understand that these are feelings that we as adults are also sharing in, uh, whether it's uh, distress and sorrow and grief for having lost loved ones uh, due to COVID or um, just situations that are going on in different parts of the country. If they happen to, if we happen to be watching television and since we're all home and together, our children are listening to what we're watching sometimes and they'll sneak in and catch things on the news, and we all know how the news cycle is right now. Uh, you can't get away from the hard topics. So uh, just being ready to address that or figure out uh, how we can kind of maybe watch uh, and catch up on the news uh, when they're asleep uh, so as not to maybe create more anxiety. 
not good to watch too much news either, even for ourselves. Um, nextly, it's important to encourage questions. Uh, let them know that we want to know what they're thinking, what they're feeling, so that we can help them um, just know uh, what it is that, um, you know, that, to help them answer the different questions. Um, then in terms of environment, we can make the home feel safe for them, remind them that the environment that they're in is safe. So reassure them that uh, our family right now is trying to keep everyone safe, doing activities with them, distraction. You can have family game nights now. Uh, one good thing, as it's been mentioned before, is that during this time, a lot of us have actually been at home more, more often with our children, and that gives us the opportunity to have dinner together, have meals together, uh, play board games, uh, do art projects, uh, just engage in uh, different things at home. Uh, it's important to also remember that social distancing is not social isolation. It's more about physical distance. So uh, trying to find every opportunity possible to connect our children with our family members and friends via Zoom, telephone, email, whatever uh, media we have available to be able to uh, interact with other people besides the immediate family uh, because uh, we want to let them know that how everyone is doing and that uh, life is still going on uh, in our different pockets. Um, the other thing is just checking in uh, often with our children, uh, making sure that we listen to them, communicate with them as much as possible and help them think positive. As it's been mentioned before, uh, this is a time of great sort of renaissance for all of us, a time to come up with what we want to do to move forward uh, in a different way. We're all learning how to act and react in a new world in many ways. Uh, so for example, before when we were teaching socialization by the little play dates and at school, where our children had the opportunity to actually interact with one another, uh, now it's we ourselves are learning kind of how to interact with each other and take the precautions of staying six feet away, which isn't sort of something that's been a norm for us. So we're both learning at the same time. Uh, but also just the etiquette of these platforms like Zoom and uh, the different media mediums to be able to know uh, how do you interact in this space, what's appropriate, um, how do you speak to one another, uh, different things like that that also come up in the virtual world, but for which we're not really, how to stay safe um, while doing a Zoom meeting, uh, different things like that. Um, and I think most importantly, uh, the big take home for us parents is we also need to cut ourselves some slack because uh, obviously this is new to all of us. Uh, there's no real manual that we can follow. Uh, we're each uh, living different circumstances in our homes. So, you know, the most that we could do is adjust accordingly. Um, and I think that that definitely is sort of uh, the takeaway message is if we can really stay in tune uh, with our children and really get a sense of where they're at, uh, then we'll know uh, when we need to reach out to professionals. At that point when, uh, despite our best efforts, uh, they're having trouble sleeping, they're having trouble just accomplishing their different daily tasks, uh, they may be having uh, nightmares and we may have tried our best and these things are still going on, then definitely reaching out to uh, professionals uh, like myself, like my colleagues. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why uh, we're out here uh, at Cope with School NYC to provide uh, online services at this time and in-person services when we get back out into the physical world to provide the individual therapy that they may need or the group therapy if they need to learn how to socialize, certainly adult bereavement groups, things like that that we all need uh, during this tough time. And certainly to provide resources, like our websites, uh, you could, you know, I, I've myself have written a blog about sort of this topic and we have several other different blog topics uh, that kind of speak to and answer several of your questions if you didn't get your answer tonight. 
So with that said, I'd just like to thank the councilman one more time. Thank you uh, very much to uh, Francis. And uh, we, we need a lot more social work in our lives. That's what I have to say about that. Uh, we're now going to get to the uh, Q&A portion of the evening. We have about 40 minutes left. I'm going to do my best to balance questions from those who have submitted theirs with their RSVP, responded on social media, by chat, or submitted and requested anonymity. Um, we're going to start with members of the audience who submitted with RSVPs. I'm going to ask those to uh, state your name, your children's age or grade, who your question is for, of all the folks uh, saying everyone will not be everyone's life either. <laughs> so please try to pick one if possible. Uh, and uh, we will start with uh, Cindy Vallejo. Hello, how are you council? Thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, my question is I have a four year old. Uh, his name is Mason, district two, one of the 95th Street, the new school right there, the preschool, District 2. Wonderful school. Um, despite all the stuff that's going on, I see that the teachers are finally getting uh, a, a hold of the situation uh, with the classes and the small groups. And I see a big improvement since we started. So that was great. My question was, I'm a working mom as well. So I'm working from home now. But... I feel like very soon that everything is opening. Um, like what's gonna happen with working parents? That's something that a lot of working parents are asking with the situation. Um, I, I, it seems like the Zoom is getting better and it's great and I'm there with my son and I'm, I'm educating him and I'm following instructions as to the best of my knowledge. Uh, but once I go back to work, that's the problem. Uh, and is that directed for the Department of Education? Yes. Okay. First, Cindy, thank you. And thank you for submitting with the RSVP. Uh, the 95th Street location is one of the pre-K centers I was able to actually open working with the real estate developer, the mayor actually himself. And so I'm glad you're getting to use it. I'm hoping I get to use it one day very soon too. Uh, one of the pieces that you should know is we're working with DOHMH, summer camp, day camp only, not sleepaway is now open uh, starting in July. If you know any providers, we're working with providers to get up and running for July. Uh, and one of the things that you can read about, it just got posted in the daily news, is we're actually, uh, we are negotiating with the mayor. I proposed about $15 billion in budget cuts, and I'd like to see a restoration of universal Sorry, I'd like to see restoration of the 30,000 summer camp slots and the beacon slots. And uh, we can also work with you individually to connect you with Stanley Isaacs and others. Uh, but um, we, I'd like to see universal summer camp for our city. Uh, that being said, we'll turn to DOE and ask DOE uh, what programs are available, whether, whether students, what, what programs are available this summer if we don't have summer camp funded by the mayor. Sure. So, Councilman, I will I will be sure to follow up um, with with your office on um, on summer camp uh, and, and summer activities or, or sorry, in lieu of summer camp, what summer activities are. Uh, I will say that, you know, again, I, and I know that that question was also directed about you know the upcoming school year. Um, look, this is something that, you know, we're, we're, we're certainly uh, aware of the, the, the fact that that, you know, parents will will be having to go back to work, uh, you know, potentially and um, that is, you know, that's very much, um, you know, a part of the discussion. That's very much a part of, you know, the plan on, uh, on, on how we're going to, how we're going to reopen. Um, you know, the reality is we're going to have to do this all, uh, all, all together. Um, so, so again, I, I, you know, we don't have at this moment, we don't have a, a response right now uh, as for what the plan will be. Uh, I can say that th those, those, uh, those uh, issues are certainly, on the minds of all of us uh, as we as we sort of uh, work to to come up with a with with the plan for reopening. Uh, 
I would like to now uh, call on Carlos Lopez, uh, who submitted a question. Uh, and uh, you're welcome to ask it. If you prefer to, to just have us deal with it uh, later, we can also do so. Uh, Carlos, it's up to you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Oh, hi. Thanks for having me. Um, and this is kind of cool. Thank you for uh, having this uh, meeting. So my question uh, relates to um, my nine-year-old. Um, he's in the fourth grade now, and he was uh, given the um, the twelve-month extended um, IEP through the IEP program. So, uh, you know, my wife and I are both health healthcare workers. And so we're kind of concerned with how this whole uh, summer IEP, how is it gonna pan out? Um, uh, what, what should we expect? And who should we like, uh, I guess what to expect is, is it uh, with this whole social distancing, is it gonna be in person? What our options are, um, who do we contact? I'm sorry, is that for DOE? That's for DOE. Sure. So, um, yeah, I can certainly um, put you in touch uh, with our, 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 you know, sort of District 75 folks. And um, I can certainly, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to take on any of those questions and, and, and circle back, uh, you know, when, uh, uh, and circle back when we can get some responses. I'd love to hear more specifically about your individual issues. Are you, are you, do you want him to do that now or do you want him to reach out to somebody? Yeah, sure. Later? He can do that. Uh, uh, he can do that. He can do that now. Sure. Uh, my email is uh, J as in jump, S as in Sam, E as in Edward, P as in Paul, U as in umbrella, L as in Larry, V as in victory, E as in Edward, D as in David, A as in Apple, the number seven at schools.nyc.gov. And we will post that into the chat and everyone on the internet now has that email address. Uh, yep. We also heard from Marissa uh, in the chat that all districts have IEP students, not just District 75. So just that mm -hmm. that is a priority sure. and just, um, we appreciate that you work with us to get the answers. I just want to note that at least with these first two questions, they were pre-submitted. So we did provide them to DOE. So hoping we can get uh, some answers as we go through the night, uh, but we will take the commitment. Uh, we did have a question come in uh, from Vanessa over chat. So uh, just seeing if she is still on our call uh, so that we can call on her. Okay, we lost Vanessa. Uh, and so we will go over to, uh, uh, to a, a long name that starts with Neo. They, they have promised that they want to uh, go for exactly 30 seconds, not a second more. And uh, they will promise to ask a question. There's a lot that they've written in the chat. So please uh, welcome uh, Neo. Uh, great, thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Thanks, council member. Okay, so my name is Dan Garo. I'm at Rockefeller University. I have children one, three, and six. I have two technical questions, one specific and one general. The specific technical question is we use Google Hangouts and we also use a program called Pat. To upload stuff. By far the most convenient way for parents is to text a photo or a video and we need a software intermediate between the texting service and the teacher's Google Hangout which is how they organize everything. If we had some sort of third-party software or some sort of solution that was created like now, <laughs> then all the parents would be able to text a picture of their children's work, and I don't know how this applies to the different grades, but that would be a data pipeline that would greatly facilitate data transfer. That's my specific question is, is someone working on that? If not, why not? And it, maybe there's something even better that I don't even know about, okay? Second question. The unparalleled opportunities to have artificial intelligence be a teacher, be an intermediate between a real teacher and a, and a student. 
because the artificial intelligence can take off with the student's strengths and give them supplement where they need it. However, uh, uh, security is c compromised and there are ethical concerns. Uh, Councilmember Kellos, do we have a, uh, 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 an initiative to evaluate the use of artificial intelligence in the um, upcoming educational innovation? That's my question. Those are my two questions. I'll, I'll mute myself now. I, for one, welcome our new AI overlords. Uh, that is a, a Futurama reference. I hope some folks thought it was funny. Uh, th that being said, when it comes to our children, I just want to make sure whatever we're doing goes through a, a peer-reviewed process and, and a scientific study just to make sure that we are not putting anyone in harm's way. That being said, um, AI in a laboratory and what have you and being at Rockefeller University, I, I'm completely open to it. Um, I'm just very much evidence-based and uh, I, I would just want to make sure whatever we're doing with AI goes past an institutional review board and is properly tested, but I, I, I'm completely open to it. In terms of the text thing, um, if they are using a Google platform, uh, whether the teacher has Google Voice or uh, a, a email address, there is a text message to email feature uh, that I'm hoping we could build in, but I, I will turn, I, I, I'm, as you probably know, a software developer and big nerd, uh, so that being said, I am open to it. I think it's something that is either inherent in the technology or could be developed, uh, but I'll turn it over to DOE about uh, exploration of AI and using, for, and I think honestly, a lot of families don't still don't have access to internet and being able to allow parents to use a feature phone, which is a phone without a real camera, but like one of the old flip phones with the camera to be able to submit homework assignments. So, so I'll say on the, on the issue of access to internet, um, we work really hard uh, and throughout the city, we've, we've doled out over 300,000 tablets um, we have two students that have been Wi-Fi enabled uh, and, and enable and, and pre-programmed with, you know, really relevant, um, relevant sort of um, uh, technology and, and applications, you know, needed for, for remote learning. Uh, as for, as for the, the, the specific question, uh, I know we're, we're always, you know, working to modernize our, our um, you know, our technology at, at, at DOE. Um, the, you know, the, the, whether, I, I mean, whether or not we're going to, we're going to be, you know, sort of working through certain, some of these AI questions. Um, I, you know, I, I think we're always going to be open to those things. I will say that every single technology decision that we make uh, is is very deeply vetted and and made sh and, and it makes sure that um, you know any every student that we that we work through with is safe. I know that this was a, an unpopular thing, right? When when we you know kind of uh, uh, closed off Zoom, um, but you know that was a decision made based on uh, making sure that that you know kids were safe and we had some serious security issues uh, as it relates to Zoom and, and some other applications. Um, but we're always we're always working to modernize, you know, how we how we move, and and uh, certainly uh, I'm always open to suggestions. Does that answer the? Uh, is that is that answer the question? <laughs> uh, yeah. It, well, it answers um, the that you're committed to doing doing it, and I think that um, we're in a time time of educational. Uh, uh, adaptation and evolution that's so forced that of course we're all very far behind but I think that um, our ability to evaluate uh, different like third-party vendors like Google Hangout Google Meet and and get and getting the data pipeline together is really important right now especially because we only have a couple months over the summer before some of these solutions may either really enable our children to learn or or not so so yes that answers my question at least in the beginning. <laughs> Thanks. Thank sure. you. And again, I just say, you know, we're always looking to, to you know, uh, move the needle forward. And uh, as technology moves forward, I know we move forward. And uh, again, I, I just want to note, though, you know, any any time we do anything, uh, especially as it relates to tech, that we always have the safety uh, and security of our, of our students uh, at, at the forefront. And so uh, whatever whatever things we do in the future as it relates to technology, that will be uh, what's most important to us. 
and, and thank you and uh, feel free to work with us. You can email policy at Ben Kalos. Uh, we're always looking for, for new ideas and ways to use to innovate to improve government and what have you. I was once asked if I could be replaced with an AI and I was pretty open to that too. Um, so my question whether or not I was a robot to begin with. Uh, we have a number of questions that were submitted by people who did not want to be called on, but we've seen those questions asked by other people. So I will uh, call on folks to ask those questions. So uh, we have a question from Caden. Uh, so if you could just share that question that you posted, that you shared in the chat. Hello, hi. Um, my question was, what is the timeline like for when DOE will decide what all will look like? I'm a single parent. Um, my work schedule really depends on whether or not there's going to be um, in-person learning, what those days will look like. I know we, the idea of staggered schedules has been thrown out. Mm -hmm. And ideally, I would need to know, okay, is my son going to be um, in school on Monday or Thursday? Right. Like, yeah. what is that time frame going to look like for parents? Yeah, again, I mean, you know, this is, this is, um, this is a really tough one, and I and I and I hear the, the the concern in your voice, right? And 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 you know, I I, uh, I sympathize. Um, you know, I, I I think unfortunately, right now, uh, you know, I think we're in this we're, we're in this situation where um, you know we're still trying to figure out what um, what what comes in September, and uh, I think you know it, it's been pretty clear that you know one month to the next looks very different in these times. Uh, not to say that we're not working on a plan, but you know it, we're you know we have to we're we're, we're trying to, to work with all of our partners, including the state and the city and, and our city partners on what a plan will look like in the future. Um, and as soon as as soon as we have that that you know that information, uh, it'll be distributed to to, to families, um, and and of course to the council member. Um, but again, my my uh, you know our our response right now is is we don't have a finalized plan at the moment. I know that's tough to hear, but that's that's the reality at this moment, uh, and and we do intend to. Hey, yep. hey Julian, I just want to jump in and say um, I think the concern you raise is something we've definitely heard from other families across the city, um, and we're actually in the process of hearing directly from parents on some of you know these personal anecdotes on some of the challenges you're facing and what you need to know soon, what your preferred return to work, uh, return to school might look like. So if you actually go to our website, schools.nyc.gov, um, the main kind of banner you'll see is a link to our page where we're encouraging parents to anonymously complete a survey where you can share some of these ideas and perspectives that will ultimately help drive um, what the best policy is for reopening. And we definitely have a lot of minds at the DOE thinking about this, um, but we're eager to really hear from parents and um, stakeholders like principals and you know, teachers across the city on, on what the best way to do this is. We just want to be sure to engage with you all first. So please definitely fill out that survey. Uh, and we, we have some of our panelists who have raised their hand. And if you're a panelist and you'd like to respond to any questions, you're always welcome. And so we have uh, Dennis uh, from UFT as well as Henry from Henry Rubio from CSA. Or just one thing I'll offer very quickly is um, to keep in mind, I think it was Carlos who says he has a fourth grader him and his wife are healthcare workers. Um, just keep in mind that the city has open regional enrichment centers for first responders. And those are places where um, you can have your children um, stay while you're at work and they will engage in instruction and be supervised and taken care of while you're at work. And again, those, those centers were open uh, with the intention of really supporting our healthcare workers and first responders. Um, I'm not sure to what extent that's been open to to other folks um and the DOE might have an answer to that it just escapes me right now but definitely they're open to first responders yeah so, sorry i'll i'll just respond to that one point um uh yeah they're open to certain um definitely first responders and other additional appearance in different occupations and that's also on our website and we're consistently evaluating kind of demand and availability of seats because we also need to maintain social distancing at those sites. Um, so we will we will be considering opening up to additional parents in additional fields um, in the future. So if you're interested, you know you can definitely apply to register, and um, 
we'll kind of keep tabs on the different, uh, the demand we have from different um, families in different fields. I can empathize with, with the parents, uh, the, the concern that I'm hearing, um, you know, I empathize with that. As a, as a parent um, and as a, an educator, I, I, um, I share the concern, but each school is different. Each district is different. I'm district one, Jessica's district two, so what we really need and what, we're, what we should have is every school should be different. The solution for every school should be different because every child is different, every school is different, every community is different. So moving forward, there really are three options for us depending on where this uh, virus goes. So if there is a vaccine, well, life is good. We're all gonna go back to normal. Um, if there's a resurgence of COVID, then we would probably continue 100% with distance learning. Um, and the third option, which would be the most challenging, um, and it might be what we have, depending on where this goes, would be a blended in-person um, and remote learning. It's a blended model of some in-person and some remote. So these are the three options that we are looking at now, um, and it all depends on what the COVID numbers do and, um, and how we respond to that. I know, I know es uh, Esther would li also like to chime in, if she could be unmuted. Hi, thank you. I actually, what I wanted to reply to that question uh, from the, uh, the gentleman who had a question about his son with his IP and summer programming, I wanted to say actually now what the DOE said and that is that we have the remote instruction centers that have been in operation this whole time and will continue to be in operation through the summer. And since that person who asked the question, I think his name was Lewis, um, he is a, um, an essential worker. His child will most certainly qualify for that. It's just a matter of applying. I know that I've done that for my children in our school and they've been very satisfied um, and we also had a question about technology and tech. That was a very interesting question. Um, at the UFT, we have something that is called the Teacher Center. And the Teacher Center is on the cutting edge. Um, and they, they are tasked with um, developing teachers throughout the city. And they're working on a lot of tech, um, interesting tech stuff. So if that parent that asked that question um, would be interested, we can connect him to our Teacher Center. Yes, and I see his... I see his uh, hand going up. So we'll absolutely connect you with the Teacher Center because I think you'd find it very interesting. And I like your background. I have some other folks I'd like to get to. Mari just asked a quick question that is on the topic of IEP. So I wanna make sure we get to that and then continue on with additional questions. And Mari, we are asking you to unmute. Uh, the, the question that Mari Tech put into the chat is, do these enrichment centers accommodate students with IEPs with behavioral issues and need for time for support for parents who are first responders and other childcare that was used are no longer available? That is for uh, DOE and anyone else who would like to jump in. Sure. So we we uh, so so our our regional enrichment centers are um, are certainly for every single parent who is a is a is an essential worker, and that includes students with IEPs. Um, I will say I will uh, as as for other parents. Uh, to be honest, I'm just going to be honest here. I don't have the answer to that question at this moment. I don't know if uh, I uh, again I, I I'm filling in, um, but I can certainly circle back and and uh, and 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 sort of get the the response. Uh, the, the next question, uh, there have been a number of versions of this question asked. I'm going to ask uh, Alexandra uh, G to just uh, share her question. Hi, yes, thank you for hearing me. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, although this year is already coming to an end, 
um, in anticipation that there might be remote learning in the fall in any form, potentially. I'm just curious whether it's the DOE or UFT that can answer this question. What is the rule for teachers? I'm sorry, hello? Yep, you're back, sorry about that. We pressed the wrong button. <laughs> That's okay, asking, I'll take What is the rule? Right, what, I got the hint though. Um, <laughs> that I was, was just, <laughs> my thing. Sorry. Um, so, for example, I have a student in middle. I have a student in middle school who obviously has a host of different teachers for each subject. The varying degrees upon which he receives live instruction uh, goes from daily for one subject and not at all for another subject. Have the teachers been provided any guidance as to what they are or are not required to do as far as interaction with their students? Um, there is no ban on live instruction. Live instruction, live engagement, uh, synchronous teaching is all good. It's all grist for the mill. Um, you know, our teachers are professionals and so it is left up to professional discretion. Some kids do better with synchronous teaching. Some kids do better with asynchronous teaching. It also depends on the subject. It depends on the grade level. So the cookie cutter approach is not the best approach. What we find is um, tailoring and personalizing instruction is really the most effective way to move forward. So you will see um, different, uh, different approaches. Like for example, Esther, she has done a blend of synchronous and asynchronous and she spoke about that earlier. Um, so there, there is a lot of misinformation out there about this, but um, they, um, but it's not true that um, that live engagement is not allowed. It is allowed, and um, and it's being used by the majority of our teachers. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to go to some of the questions that were submitted. Again, a lot have been asked either by other people on this or in one way or another. Uh, one of the questions that came in is uh, relating to grading. And the question is, if, we, if remote learning continues in the fall or a hybrid approach is adopted, are schools going to continue to grade satisfactory or needs improvement? And I imagine that is for DOE. Hey, so, um, so you know, that question I think will be answered when we, when we reopen. Uh, or, or when we, we when we come forth with our reopening plan, uh, I know that's something that you know that, that our current grading policy really uh, is for the, the the end of the school year. As for the for, for the following for the for the upcoming school year, um, you know that's something we're going to obviously uh, have to have to revisit uh, in the coming year. Uh, yeah, and I just want to put in a plug once again to fill out the survey online because it's looking for exactly these kind of concerns and, and thoughts. So I'll also put it in the chat. Thank you very much. I'd like to now transition to, uh, and we've got about 12 minutes left, so I'm eager to get through all the questions. Uh, if you still have questions that you didn't get answered, we, we did have you, uh, DOE chair there. Uh, email address, and we also paste my personal email address at bkalos at benkalos.com into the chat, and we will continue to work with people to get answers, whether it is big picture questions or just individual cases. So this is mental health, uh, and uh, I imagine we'll be directing this at COPE with schools, but any panelists should feel free to raise their hands. Uh, we have three questions here. One is, how do you distinguish between behavior one would expect during this time and when professional intervention is necessary? questions. Uh, I believe I addressed it a little bit uh, during the first part of my uh, talk. Uh, essentially, parents know you're the ones who know your child best, so you kind of have a sense of what their behaviors are like uh, on the regular. You know when they like to go to sleep, when they're being fussy. Uh, so when the child is at a point where um, he's not acting like your normal child, he's had nightmares several days in a row, or if you just have this feeling that something's wrong, that's the time to definitely reach out. It's always better to be safer rather than sorry. So if you feel that you want to reach out and you feel your child is not quite at their baseline, as far as you know, that would be the time to contact us. 
another question that was submitted is, are, what are some strategies to help my child cope with increased anxiety? Uh, well, like I uh, mentioned, one of the things that you could do is just creating that safe environment for your child. Uh, definitely having family time so that you can watch family movies, uh, just having meals with them, letting them know that you're with them, uh, tucking them in, little things like that uh, help in terms of like the interaction with parents. Uh, in terms of different exercises, uh, there's belly breathing. There's a great little Elmo video that like uh, belly breathe. It's Elmo and common. Uh, I like to do that with my younger kids uh, just because it's just so funny that it helps reduce anxiety. And then you're also learning the appropriate technique for breathing, which is something that most of us, you know, we think, oh, we breathe because we're alive and we all know how to breathe. Well, it's a lot, uh, a little more complicated than that. It takes like breathing literally from the diaphragm. You want to actually be filling up the lungs. If any of you play wind instruments, that's you've gotten the practice of your vocalists. It's all about a special type of breathing and that helps us calm down. Uh, also music, uh, light music, classical music, uh, little things like that. And anything else that you know that your child likes, like their uh, safety blanket or toys, uh, or leaving the light on uh, at nights every now and then. Yes, I'd like to add also, if I may, that um, teachers have been helping with that too. I know in my school, we ask, we post what seem to be very soothing for children in class in our song and movement class, uh, section in, on classwork. And we also provide parents with a schedule that they could follow at home. And like you said, routines are very important in following routines, the same routines almost that they had in school like I mentioned before, fun activities as well as school activities. And it's also very important also to listen to children, just to allow them to talk and not necessarily always reacting to everything they say, but just to listen to them so that they understand that there is somebody who cares about their emotions and is willing to listen. And also in terms of the schooling piece, uh, just with my child, uh, one thing that I've done is, uh, sometimes you can't get all the schooling in, so sometimes you have to be forgiving of the child and of yourself. So if there's one day that they're particularly heavy on assignments, even if you do it later or you talk to the teacher, work something out to facilitate it because it's hard for a child to understand that they're having a school schedule in the home. Uh, it's almost like it, it doesn't compute for them because they're in a different environment. So, it, it, you know, it takes a little negotiating for sure. We have a question in the chats about the variations, um, you know, how, how instruction varies. Um, one of the things as educators, you know, I'm a long time special educator, 28 years. In my career, I've always thought about equity. Not all my children come from the same backgrounds. Not all my children come from a background of means. So as an educator, I wanna think about equity. If I'm doing synchronous live instruction, can all my children access that? Do all of them have access to a device at, at any given time at 11 a.m.? Okay, everyone, let's sign in at 11 a.m. I have to take into consideration that that household may only have one or two devices to be shared among eight people. So I think to his credit, our chancellor, Carranza, has discussed flexibility. From the beginning of this, he has, it's has been his mantra, flexibility. And I credit him for that because he's taking into consideration that we have many different backgrounds, many different, um, many different abilities to access what we have to offer. So, you know, our educators are thinking about that. So um, it, it has to be a mixed, flexible approach. And, and that's what, a blended approach. And, if, and I talked about the three scenarios for returning and, and possibly in September. If we do return, if it's a blended model, it's going to have to be flexible because not everyone has a device per person in the home. Um, it's just, that's just a fact. It's a fact of the city. Like Etty um, said earlier, Esther said earlier, it's a tale of two cities. And we have to be cognizant of that. So that's why um, we, we support the flexible model. Thank you. And, and um, I appreciate it. And I think we've covered, gone into a lot of the different teaching styles and what have you. Um, I'd like to just try to wrap up. We've got about six minutes left. So I just want to get some through a lot, some of the last questions. The last mental health question is, um, well, first I just want to, want to thank uh, 
Francis just because I know my daughter loves, I can't say the word because I'm afraid she'll hear it and wake up, but E-L-M-O. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually going to see if we can try that this morning. And if anyone's ever had to sit through my graduation speech the hundred times uh, I used to give it, we have a new graduation speech. So I will just tell you that the uh, punchline was that the secret to life is breathing. If you stop breathing, that's it. Uh, and so uh, on that last question on mental health is, how can I help my child feel less isolated? Well, uh, one of the things that uh, I've mentioned throughout is the importance of giving them uh, the opportunity to connect with you. I know we're all very busy, uh, even though we're home. Uh, it's, it's confusing for them because especially the younger kids, uh, we're sitting at a computer, we're at home, they think we're present, but mentally we have to be somewhere else. Uh, we're trying to handle our meetings. So whenever we do have breaks to actually engage them, um, whenever we can have meals with them, as much time as we can spend with them. Also uh, reaching out to other parents and um, family members to connect, connect them via Zoom. Uh, still, if we, obviously we're also phase one, um, as long as you're still distancing six feet apart, uh, you can have play dates, whatever that might look like. It's hard with little kids, obviously, um, because their first instinct is they want to embrace each other. They haven't seen each other in a long time. Uh, but if you can come up with a way that you can engage in uh, different activities uh, that keep them away, uh, badminton, I don't know, <laughs> uh, little games or something that, that requires some distance, uh, whatever you can do to make things as normal as possible, certainly going for a walk and um, just sharing the space and being out in nature as well. Thank you. Uh, and I, I will just say that that is one of the tough spots. Uh, we have two more questions that were pre-submitted. Uh, these are two questions that I'm incredibly, uh, I, I feel a personal stake in it. You already know I have a two-year-old. Uh, I promise I did not submit these. Uh, you, you'll, you'll know why, but uh, the first question is, I am pregnant with a two and a half year old energetic toddler in a small apartment. He is bored with his toys and wants out, but there is nowhere safe. People don't use masks. How can we keep him occupied with resources at home? Or when, where can we go for him to run around and expend <laughs> his energy? Um, if anyone wants to raise their hands on the panel. I mean, just quickly, um... To add to what I was saying before in terms of home uh, exercise, uh, a lot of the schools have provided links to things like Go Noodle and different sort of uh, videos where the kids can sing and dance with their favorite characters, uh, anything that you can do uh, in terms of just being like in the living room or you can ask them to help out with things at home if you need to move stuff around the house uh, and help them have them help you clean up the house uh, and make it a game uh, even anything um, Simon says uh, schools are doing a lot in reaching out uh, to families and there's different things on YouTube as well that you can uh, look up because people are trying to keep kids active they, they're not meant to be obviously sitting and just watching TV, they should be standing up and engaging uh, as much as possible. I, I will share some of my own trade secrets, which is just uh, my daughter wakes me up every day at 5.30 or 6.30. And during the pandemic, that is not a bug, that is a feature. And what my wife and I have discovered is that New York City before noon is very different uh, during the pandemic than New York City afternoon. So generally, we will try to have breakfast, do all the morning routine items, and try to get out the door by 8 or 9 a.m. Uh, my wife is being very polite and not saying that uh, we inevitably don't make it out the door till 10. But that generally gets us a chance to get to one of the local parks. We've discovered Central Park is completely off limits and not usable, but um, we do have the luck of, I, I was able to close down East End Avenue. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable with your child playing on the, literally the street on East End Avenue because there are still cars there, uh, Carl Schurz uh, is 
pretty big and folks are very respectful there. There's a lot of other families there who are all wearing masks unless they've settled down to uh, picnic as it were. Um, and uh, I am certain if you take a look, I, I don't want to give up all of my secret hiding spots as it were. There are a lot of different parks throughout the neighborhood that I encourage you to visit if you're in the south part of the neighborhood. Uh, we have Sutton Place Park, which is near the water and it has some space where you can let your child run around. And uh, generally we will try to do some high energy activities such as uh, tag uh, or, or what have you to, to get through some of that energy. Um, and there's also some other larger parks throughout the city. Um, and even within Central Park, uh, if, you, if you head northbound, there tends to be a lot less foot traffic than if you head southbound. Um, so there's a lot of different places. And uh, I think um, we've just been trying to discover as much of our city as we can, uh, seeing if any other panelists want to weigh in. The other question is, uh, how do you teach a two and a half year old child to socialize when you're literally telling them to stay away from people and other children? Well, that's, that's a tough one. Um, I mean, it's kind of like when we used to say, you know, stranger danger, and we were telling kids to stay away from people. And then you have that mixed message with family members where you want them to kind of uh, reach out and some of them uh, could be shy. Uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, I think that a lot of us are um, learning to socialize again now uh, because a lot, some of the things that we used to do while socializing uh, aren't coming in uh, the same way and like shaking hands or uh, just all these new precautions that we have to follow. So the first step is learning ourselves and modeling it. Uh, and for all other interactions, it's just the way that we kind of get along and home in those dynamics uh, because they'll kind of, that's how they learn by watching our actions, not as much what we say, but what we do. Hi, I wanted to add on to the question, the previous question about the child, a two-year-old child who's uh, bored at home. You know, one thing I can suggest in, in pre-K classroom settings, we have something called centers. And centers are just areas that, are, that encourage a certain kind of activity. For example, we have a library, we have a dress up corner, we have a block area. So the children kind of maneuver themselves around as they choose and whatever is engaging to them at that moment, they play with that. So at home with your two-year-old, you can actually set up those center times. And, um, you know, the outside resources were, were great that you gave in so many of them. But inside, you can create that kind of playground setting, the classroom setting at home. And you can consider if you want, this is just a suggestion, to keep certain uh, centers open at certain times of the day. So the interest is there. It's not always available. It's something to look forward to. And um, in terms of well-being, here's another suggestion for a center. You can have a quiet area. You know, we have a quiet area in um, pre-K where there are comfy chairs, some soothing toys, maybe some manipulatives that they can play with when they're feeling anxious. And that could also be a center in your home. So when your child is feeling anxious, they can go there, he or she can go there and just experience some alone time and some comfort time, or you may join the child there if he invites you in. I hope that helps. <laughs> uh, Sally had some resources, you're unmuted. Yeah, no, I was just going to add to what, what you just said about um, different times of the day and areas of, of your apartment, should you have enough space to designate certain places that are set up for kids to play independently near you while you're working, um, because you can't be with them all the time, but they can play looking at books or playing with their toys in a particular area. And the other thing I wanted to add is the East River, you talked about Sutton Place, but walking all along that stretch, that wonderful new stretch of the East River that um, where kids, where you can run and there aren't that many people there. And you, and gave, some, you, that. And you gave some excellent um, uh, resources, online resources when we first began. And I use that, Epic Books. It's free right now during the, during the pandemic for parents. Um, excellent resources, and there's books, books also, V-O-O-K-S, also free for parents right now. And of course, you know, um, if you know your child is interested in something, 
then you can always look for it online and maybe share that time with them too. So it's not meaningless, it's targeted. You can always target interest and follow up with resources. Uh, we, we are just over by about five minutes. So I wanna also share that uh, you, you might get, uh, you might think that the only place to buy eBooks is uh, on Amazon or Barnes and Noble, but pretty much any eBook you can get and pay for, you can actually borrow from the New York Public Library. I pasted the link in there. And anytime we are leaving the house and going anywhere and I can't just left along our library of books, uh, I will check out probably more books than I should as eBooks and uh, read them to my daughter off my phone or off a tablet or a laptop. Uh, so there's, there's a lot there. Um, I want to thank folks. Uh, we saw, we've seen attendance stay strong throughout this event. I think we topped out at about uh, 80 folks, both on social media and on the Zoom. I, I want to thank our presenters. They brought so much knowledge, so much expertise. And um, just, I guess, uh, I also want to thank our parents and, and everyone. If you have any feedback on how to improve this event as the future, I think what I'm hearing is that there's a lot of anxiety out there. Folks want to do well for their children. And as we head back into the school year, I'm hoping we might do this again in, in August or September. So let me know what you think. Uh, share any ideas you have on how to improve this. And uh, if you can please uh, join me in giving a, a huge, huge thank you to all of our presenters from the 92nd Street Y, Sally Tannen, Tracy Birkin from CSA, Henry Rubio from UFT, uh, our, our master teacher, Esther uh, Savisky, Dennis Galt, Jessica Harvey from DOE, Julian Sepulveda for filling in, as well as uh, from admissions. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us, Nadia, uh, from Cope with Schools, Francis Laura, to just answer so many of the mental health questions that we had. And I know I got a lot of pointers from everyone. And I, I'm getting the thumbs up from my wife that this is one event that she uh, actually enjoyed uh, attending while sitting in the living room just off camera. So thank you all. I also want to thank my amazing staff. They're all the folks labeled as staff in the participants list. Uh, we couldn't have done this without you. We are here to be a resource through you, for you through this pandemic uh, and to do whatever we can. Uh, thank you very much and have a good night.